let's do liquids and solids here. Phase diagram. <clears throat> Phase diagram, I would say the two common things are either to draw it or interpret one. The interpretation could be uh, just in words, or it could be looking at a graph. So let's just make sure we got this straight. Let's make a little review. I, uh, if you're in an engineering or physics class, you might need to memorize all different kinds of phase diagrams, different elements. Not element. Compounds have different phase diagrams. I am not looking for that in our class. I just want to know, do you know the generic phase diagram or not? So you need to know where the triple point is, where the critical point is, this is the super critical uh, fluid up here. Uh, you want to know that it's pressure versus temperature. You want to know that this line right here represents what? The Colossus Clapron, I guess we'll do that next since we mentioned it. Uh, and then you'd want to be able to draw an isobar or an isotherm. Uh, an isobar would be horizontal or vertical. Horizontal, isobar, constant pressure, isotherm, constant temperature. So, such that, let's draw one right uh, here. Let's say you start here and you get to this point at the end. Uh, what kind of phase change is this? What would you call it? Yeah, it's actually two phase changes. So first you're going to uh, melt. So it'll be some sort of melting. Or you can also call it what? Yeah, like a delta H effusion. And then you're going from here to here. So that would be a vaporization. So delta H vaporization. Okay. Why is this not sublimation? Yeah, the sublimation would be if it goes through here, this line, from a solid to a gas. Though, uh, the delta H of fusion plus the delta H of vaporization will equal uh, the delta H of sublimation. Because it is what kind of function? State. Yeah, doesn't matter how you get there. Okay, good. All right, bonus stuff here. That's awesome. Um, by the way, this, that cross section, oh yeah, go ahead. Hi. Oh, hi. Uh, the critical point, that was where, and I think we'll do an example in class uh, on Tuesday. Uh, let's say you have a gas in a liquid, and then you heat this. Okay, uh, what's going to start to happen is the dense, which is greater, density of gas or density of liquid? Liquid. So the, density, so the density of gas is much less, but this will start to decrease. The density of the liquid will start to go up. And uh, gamma, or, which is what I used to call the surface tension, will approach zero. So when it approaches zero, will that phase boundary between the liquid and the gas disappear? That's called the critical point. Now you can get hotter or raise the pressure on that. Uh, and once you go past a critical point, we call it supercritical fluid. Mm -hmm. It'd be something that's sort of a gas and sort of a, a liquid. Yeah. So that's what happened. It'll happen at some point out here, typically. Yes? Uh, yeah, okay. So there's two things I want to say about the graph. Let's start. Let's start with the other thing I was going to say, because Flash's platform was its own topic. Okay. So first, this cross section right here, we also call what kind of curve? <coughs> yeah, that's the heating curve right there. So that was, if I draw it down here, remember we plot temperature versus time and we get for water something that looks like that? So here's the solid, here's the liquid, here's the gas. That's this cross section. So when you're isobaric or at constant pressure, then that's this. So when you put an infinite number of these together in different pressures, you generate the phase diagram. Okay, so that's how those two are related. And then the second question was about the Clausius clapeyron 
And what's the deal right here? So I have to go to the next page for that one. Okay, so that uh, if you plot pressure versus temperature, same plot, but you're focused only on the liquid gas interface, uh, you get vapor pressure lines that look like this. If you slightly remember, and this is where we derived the Cloche's clock run, or what we derived it from. Uh, here, and this is also where I said, if this is atmospheric pressure, then what's this point right there? Yeah, that would be the boiling point. So that's where the vapor pressure, so hopefully it kind of makes sense, as the temperature goes up, the vapor pressure of a liquid will go up. So as water gets hotter, more will vaporize. It happens to go up according to a natural log function. So that's why it looks exponential. And then that vapor pressure, once it equals atmospheric pressure, it will start to boil. The phenomenon will be boiling, so we call that the boiling point. So this is just a small piece of the phase diagram. So, and the Cloche's Clapron describes that. We did this piece first, just so we could talk, because we were just talking about liquids at that point. And we had introduced solids, and then you saw the whole diagram, which is, we call a phase diagram. Okay. So this is exponential, so that follows the Cloche's Clapron. Let's write that down, though you don't have to memorize it. If you teach this class enough, you will memorize it. Uh, a lot of folks ask me, uh, if you look this up in different resources, the formula might look slightly different. This is how I'm going to write it on my exam. Uh, but if you see it in different resources, they might switch signs in different funny places. It's the same formula. So this is what I'm going to give. If you like a different formula that just is a different sign, but we'll get to the same answer, you'll have to memorize it and just remember it. Okay? But, it's still the Cloche's Clapron. Uh, and we use this typically when there's two states and one uh, compound. So if you have one compound and two states, by two states I mean two temperatures and two pressures. So let's say you know P1 and T1 and you know T2 and you want to know P2. Uh, one way that we get around that, especially if it's water, so sometimes we don't give you the second state because we want to be a little tricksy like a fox, we'll say we're at the normal boiling point of water. So the normal boiling point means you're at what temperature? 100 degrees C or you would write 373 Kelvin because this takes Kelvin only. And you're at what pressure? Yeah, one ATF. So uh, you can always use the normal boiling point of water for your second point if you're not given a second point and the substance is water. Okay. Uh, you would have to know these numbers. We wouldn't give it to you. So you have to know by yourself the boiling point of water. We will give you the delta H of vaporization of water, though, or whatever substance you would need. Okay. Most common mistakes here are math errors, not knowing how to solve for the pressure or temperature. So use your calculator before you get to the test and make sure you can do this. Also, remember to use Kelvin and which are? The 8.3145 because you want it in joule units. Oh, was there another question here? Okay. Yes. Uh, you mean algebraic, how that would work? Or so how I would do the algebra? Okay. You, why don't you pick one for me? T1 or T2? Yeah. Okay. And I, I personally, I think solving for the pressure is harder for most people, but let's do the temperature since you asked. Uh, but make sure you can do the pressure. Okay. T2, I think you said, if I had to solve for T2, if that was my unknown, what I would do is I'd grow natural log of P2 over P1. I would move the R over and the delta H of vaporization over. You gotta invert it because you're moving it over to the other side. And this would be one over T1 minus one over T2. Then I would subtract the T1 over. So I go, okay, I got minus T1 plus R over delta H of vaporization, natural log P2 over P1. 
equals minus 1 over t2. So far okay? And then I would flip the signs, I'm going to get a different color. Multiply through by minus 1, like that. Because I want to solve for t2 and I want it to be positive over there. And then I would take the inverse of each side. So, finally, yeah, t2 equals 1 over 1 over t1 plus negative r delta h of vaporization, natural log p2 over p1. So you should be able to solve for any variable in this equation. Okay. Now you can put in the numbers. I didn't have any numbers, so I just did with the variables. Okay. Uh, kind of related. Let me do this next. So I'm going to put our slide back up. Uh, we just did, by the way, clutch clap on. That's out. Let's talk about vapor pressure because we're sort of on that topic. I'm going to flip over to gosh, what chapter was that? I think. Yes, I think uh, it's in my solutions chapter. I made this little flow chart. This is on page 49. Let's just do a little vapor pressure review. So every liquid will have a vapor pressure. Oh, bonus question. Can a solid have a vapor pressure? Ooh, there's a fight. Yes or no, there is a clear answer. Yes, it can. What is a, an example you would buy, could buy at the grocery store that has a vapor pressure? Dry ice. Dry ice, carbon dioxide. It comes as a solid, it vaporizes. Uh, let's just, just make sure we got this. Just do, here we go. If it had a vapor pressure, what part of the phase diagram are you looking at? Right there. If it sublimes, meaning it goes from a solid to a gas, it will have a vapor pressure. Okay, is that kind of okay? So it can, yes. Some solids, the vapor pressure is pretty much negligible or irrelevant. You might be thinking of like iron or something. That doesn't have any appreciable vapor pressure, but it could. Uh, there are things that do have uh, vapor pressures that make sense. Okay, back to page 49. Most of the time we're talking about liquids having a vapor pressure. Okay, so four types of vapor pressure problems you want to be familiar with. We just talked about the cautious clapperon. If there's only one state, one temperature, one pressure, then it defaults to the ideal gas law. That's like chem 2A stuff. We did one example in my class. Uh, Raoul and Dalton's law, we're coming up with an example of that. That's when you have multiple compounds or components. Okay, so multiple compounds in play. And then there's one physical property that we discussed, the vapor pressure, including, you know, boiling point, there was others, but we did vapor pressure when you have a bunch of different compounds. No math, but just qualitatively, which one has, say, the highest or lowest vapor pressure. So if there's no numbers, but there's multiple compounds, you're probably talking about this right there. Those are the common vapor pressure uh, problems you would come across. Person who asked this, did you want more information than that? And if so, what would that be? Yes? You're good. Okay. So, it's mostly discerning what kind of problem you're entering into, and these are the four we've seen. Okay. Uh, we did a little bit of delta H of uh, fusion, at least I mentioned it. Person who asked, was there more information you were looking for here? So again, that's between, that's the melting between the solid and liquid. It just has a particular name. If you're melting, by the way, endo or exothermic? Melting. Am I putting heat in or taking it out? In, endothermic. If it's going into the system to melt something, imagine melting ice, it's endothermic. So delta H is greater than zero. Okay. Uh, person asked more information, so I'm okay. You, you'd see that in a phase change sort of question. Phase change sort of question. So you could see it, for example, unless it's just at, you know, asking like is it endo or exothermic, you might see it in um, like a calorimetry problem where something changes phases, say ice melts or freezes. Okay. 
Nobody asked me one of those, so I don't have one of, or I'm not doing one of those right now. Okay, definition, surface tension and cohesion. We do that down here. I think what was asked, what's the difference? Uh, it's a similar sort of force uh, or similar idea. So that's why I paired them together in my class. Uh, so cohesion, that's when you have uh, forces between like molecules. So if it's the same molecule and the force, the primary force is between them, that's a cohesive force. So the example I gave is if you wax your car and then a raindrop falls on it, the raindrop will bead. That means the water is not attracted to the wax on your car, so it, the main force is between the water molecules, so it forms a little ball. Uh, and so cohesion is the main force there. Uh, you see that illustrated in one sense in surface tension. Surface tension, let's say you have water. So here's the liquid down here, here's the gas up there. I'm gonna illustrate the water molecules by just little balls here. Okay, like that. Okay, uh, if something has a strong surface tension, that means the intermolecular force is strong or they're grabbing on to each other. I put two arrows facing each other, just to mean they're holding on strong. So there's a strong cohesive force between like molecules and most of the time, uh, in our class, we're talking about cohesive forces because we're asking, what's the intermolecular force of this molecule, meaning this with another one like it? So we're talking about cohesive forces typically. Um, I did do a couple examples of adhesive forces, which would be between different molecules. So for example, you can have hydrogen bonding between two different types of molecules, which you see in bio a lot. But uh, nobody asked me about that stuff, so we're skipping that.